Welcome everybody to a great panel that I think we're all gonna enjoy. It's called FCC versus the Department of Defense Spectrum Fight, Legato GPS and the Future of Spectrum Policy. I'm Gigi Sohn. I'm a distinguished fellow at the Georgetown Law Institute for Technology, Law and Policy, and also a Benton Institute Senior Fellow and Public Advocate. And a couple of years ago, I was a counselor to FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler. Of course, my career is longer than that, but we don't have time for me to recite my entire resume, so I won't. Let me give a little background. I know there are a bunch of folks on this call. I saw the registrant list. Uh, that know an awful lot about this topic. So I do apologize, but uh, to the extent that there may be some people who are not as familiar about what this spectrum fight is about, let me explain it. And I also want to apologize, you know, it's COVID-19 times and not all of us have great broadband. And so there may be some freezing and balkiness and we'll do our level best uh, to provide you with a good show. I can guarantee you have a good show, but as always, there may be some technical difficulties. Um, so let me give a little bit of background on what we're talking about here. So on April 19th of this year, the FCC unanimously approved with numerous conditions, Legato's application to repurpose L-band spectrum, that's the one to two gigahertz band of spectrum, to deploy a low power terrestrial nationwide network that will primarily support 5G and internet of things services. Now, this action aligns with what the FCC has been doing now for the last several years uh, to make additional what they call mid-band spectrum available for 5G deployment. Now, even by FCC standards, and I was there, and uh, I realize how small the bureaucracy works, uh, but even by FCC standards, the road to approval was a very, very long process. Legato first sought FCC permission to provide terrestrial service 10 years ago, 2010. But its predecessor company, LightSquared, first petitioned the agency in 2003. So we are talking about a proceeding that has been going on for 17 years, which is just about a little bit shorter than the net neutrality battle's been going on, but it's been going on a long time. So the FCC's April order was a culmination of a process that included extensive negotiations, a huge record, including major technical studies, several technical studies, which I'm sure we'll get into later, as well as several modifications to Legato's application. Now, in the past two months since the decision was made, there's been growing scrutiny over the FCC's decision. But Legato really is the only a recent flare-up between the FCC and other federal agencies over a 5G spectrum policy. There have been others, which we'll also discuss today. Today, we'll be discussing the FCC's Legato decision, the response from the Hill and other executive agencies, the integrity of the interagency process and also how it works, and the future of spectrum allocation with a bipartisan panel of experts. So let me introduce them very briefly in alphabetical order. The first is Harold Feld, Senior Vice President of Public Knowledge. Harold is highly regarded as a thought leader in the areas of spectrum reform, antitrust, broadband deployment, and also online platform regulation. And he's a frequent author on technology, broadband access, and wireless policies. His blog, Tales of the Sausage Factory, helps explain how FCC decisions affect people and communities on the ground. And if you've never read Tales of the Sausage Factory, you must. Now you must have time because I don't think any blog post is shorter than 5,000 words, but if you really wanna understand how this stuff works, Harold will tell it to you. Second, Daniel Hoffman, who's a fellow at the Intelligence Project at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at the Harvard Kennedy School. Now, Daniel's resume scares the living daylights out of me. He's obviously really smart, but he's scary. So he's a former senior executive clandestine service officer with the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA. He developed extensive substantive expertise on geopolitical and transnational issues related to the Middle East, South Asia, Russia, counterterrorism, and cyber and counterintelligence during his 30 years of distinguished government service with the CIA, U.S. Military, Department of State, and Department of Commerce. That is an amazing resume. Daniel, it's great to have you here. Thanks. And last, but certainly not least, my friend Joel Thayer, who's an attorney at Phillips Lytle LPP. Now, Joel is one of these up-and-comers. He focuses his practice on telecommunications, regulatory and transactional matters, as well as privacy and cybersecurity issues. He's a former policy counsel for the App Association and has clerked for both the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, 
and the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC. So it's great to have the three of you here. And I want to dive in really quickly with questions. And before we actually start, I did forget one thing. If folks have questions, I see there's already stuff in the chat. Uh, please send me questions to the chat. We're going to try to talk here for about 40, 45 minutes, and then we'll take questions. Um, I can't promise I'll get to all of them. In fact, we had some questions sent to us uh, before the panel even started. So I will do my uh, level best to get as many questions into the panel as, as possible. And please make them questions uh, and not advocacy, state, advocacy statements or talking points, because I can assure you, I, I know what they look like and I will not read them. So legitimate questions and they can be pushbacks. I have no problem with that, but make sure they're questions and not speeches. Uh, and I will do my level best to um, answer, have the panel answer as many as possible. So do put them in the chat. And once we get to the Q&A, uh, I, uh, I will send them off to the, to the panelists. Okay, let's start with a really broad question. Because again, this is a super weedy topic if we want it to be, and we will get into the weeds. But I want to pull it out a bit and ask in the simplest terms, why should people and policymakers care about this issue? Legato, spectrum, interference, it's just like it's so much noise, right? But why should we care? And I'm going to start with Harold. Well, the reason we need to care is because we're looking at fundamental questions about how spectrum policy in this country is going to work. Everyone knows we have an insatiable demand for more wireless, for 5G, for uh, unlicensed uh, new Wi-Fi uh, products. Um, we can't um, you know, get access to enough of it. That means that pretty much everything we do to expand available wireless capacity is going to be either in coordination with uh, federal spectrum users on bands that are allocated for federal spectrum or next to or approximate to uh, these uh, federal user bands. And what we've seen here is that um, the uh, process by which the federal agencies work with the FCC has just completely fallen apart. Um, we are uh, seeing um, an effort to basically pull uh, the formation of 5G policy and national wireless policy away from the expert agency where it's supposed to reside and pull it back to uh, federal agencies who are, you know, in fairness, I understand it, but, you know, they're interested in protecting their own parochial uh, interests. And that's exactly why Congress said that we have the FCC the expert agency, which doesn't actually use Spectrum, be the one that makes the decisions. Okay, Joel or Daniel, either of you guys want to weigh in? Or did Harold say it all? I think Harold uh, said most of it, but I would just add one more thing, and that is to harp on the uh, fact that the FCC is an independent agency. And a lot of these decisions that the FCC makes is not necessarily attenuated to any particular presidential uh, agenda. And so to have an agency make those types of policies are essential in promoting all the things that Harold is talking about. So I agree categorically with what Harold said, but I think it is important to note that the FC is the independent agency, the expert agency, and having another agency that is essentially attenuated to the president is a bit concerning for, from my perspective. Right. So it's not just about 5G services and how important they may eventually be to the consumer and to industry, but it's also about the process and making sure the process works properly. Right. Daniel, did you have anything you want to add? Yeah, I'll add a little more context just from the perspective here sitting in Washington, D.C. Uh, right. There's also a national security component because of our increasingly acrimonious relationship with China. And for sure, we are competitors um, in high technology. China is racing ahead with their own deployment of 5G and anything that slows us down is going to cause us uh, more problems. Now we've got a lot of interest here in, in Washington and throughout our country about Huawei and the concern that Huawei would open up back doors for China to spy on us or conduct cyber warfare in the event of any sort of conflict. Um, it's not just about blocking Huawei, it's about having a viable alternative and I can tell you, I've, I've served many years, as you noted, in the U.S. government, and 
we got to stop admiring the problem. Um, this isn't one that's going to get better like fine wine with age. Um, we kind of need to come to a solution here. And uh, that's what thus far we've failed to do. Great. So let me try to condense as much as possible. And again, I'm sure folks that, you know, oppose the Legato decision may not agree with my framing of, of, of their arguments, but let me give it a whirl. So it seems that they come down, opponents of, Legato, of the Legato decision really kind of frame their arguments three ways. One is that the process by which the order was adopted wasn't transparent and was done in a hurried fashion. Two, that the decision would somehow slow down the deployment of 5G services, so sort of the opposite of what you guys said. And three, that Legato's operations would cause harmful interference with GPS and other satellite communications, and that the FCC didn't go far enough to protect adjacent band operations, which include both commercial and military services. So let's take each of these in turn. So Harold, would you mind discussing the process argument, you know, that this was done dead of night, right? Didn't the decision come out on a Sunday, which, you know, when does that happen? Yeah, I mean, the, this is the, the process arguments reflect either just a basic unfamiliarity with how the FCC works or a deliberate effort to try to mislead people. This proceeding has gone on for years. The DOD, the Department of Transportation, the NTIA, all of these federal agencies have been heavily involved in this. We expected, everybody was expecting this to be resolved last year, uh, around uh, the end of the year, when DOD uh, um, you know, objected again, not with any new evidence, but just filing the same objections that they had. Uh, then in January, Chairman Pai sent uh, the draft over order, over order over to NTIA, the National Telecommunications Information Administration, which is the agency that serves as the point of contact between the FCC and the executive. And that was a courtesy. You don't have to give them any kind of preview on this. Um, and they uh, uh, sent it to them anyway. And NTIA kept saying, no, we're not going to move off of this position. We're not going to approve it. And we're not really going to change or so finally, the FCC just said, all right, we, we, we've said everything there is to say. Um, they put, the chairman received this order from the bureau. That's the usual way in which this works. And all of the commissioners get briefings on this. All of the commissioners had meetings with the principals. You can check the record and you can see that folks were in on a regular basis and clearly knew that this was coming. The only thing that mattered was the formality of a vote. Now, this is where some people may miss a step because what we're used to is the FCC public meeting where, you know, they vote on a couple of big ticket items, but the vast majority of orders from the commission are voted on what's called circulation, which is the chairman sends it to each of the commissioner's offices and said, hey, you want to vote for it or not? And in this case, since everybody was very familiar with this and the uh, engineering analysis was quite thorough, um, they simply said, yeah, you know what, we're voting yes. Um, and that process uh, was relatively simple and straightforward. Um, it is very common uh, for items uh, like this. Um, and, uh, you know, the fact that it appeared uh, on the FCC's website on a Sunday after they uh, uh, had voted on it is just a, uh, you know, matter of how these things move through the automatic pipeline within the agency from the minute that it gets voted out to when it gets the final spell check and, you know, proofing, because it's always embarrassing when these things go out with typos. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, so there was nothing odd or mysterious or unusual about this. The only thing, in fact, that was unusual about this was how long it took. Yeah, yeah. yeah but I think people don't realize that only, for the most part, the orders that get voted on in commission meetings are controversial within the commission, right? This was a unanimous decision. This really wasn't controversial as far as the commission was concerned. Right, so and in fact, most people are probably not even aware that when the FCC puts out an agenda, it's not uncommon for them to just vote unanimously on a couple of items right. and take those off the yep. agenda. That's right. just how this works. Yes. Uh, other, otherwise, the, the, the uh, meetings would be very, very long, and they're already very long, so they would even be longer. So let me switch over to Daniel and, and ask him what he thinks about 
the argument that this somehow would, would slow down a 5G deployment. I mean, how should we think about, you know, Legato's fit into the 5G landscape? And, and, and how do you respond to that argument that, that this decision would slow down 5G deployment and, and roll out of 5G services? First of all, I want some of what Harold's drinking. <laughs> uh, you know, um, look, the fastest way to 5G is through use of the L-band, and that's what Legato is proposing. I haven't seen any other alternatives. Um, we want to get to 5G as fast as we can. If we use that L-band, and, and from the thousands of hours of testing, um, we can be pretty sure. I'm not a scientist like some other folks out there, but based on what I've read, there's no collateral damage to military communications and GPS. Um, those were the conclusions that were drawn. And so the only holdup is this bureaucratic sinkhole that we're in um, and not proceeding as expeditiously as we can with giving Legato the chance to get on the L band and start the process going. If we don't have that, we don't get to 5G and we kind of lose the technology race, which is not in our best interest from a national security perspective, also from an economic commercial perspective. So Joel, you get the tough one or the weedy one, which is about interference. And this is, you know, you hear planes are going to fall out of the sky and people are not going to, their GPS isn't going to work. And you know, so can you just address those? And what did the FCC do uh, to assuage those concerns? Uh, did what the FCC did do actually did, did they mitigate the concerns? Are there outstanding concerns that they should have to deal with? So Talk again, if you can start in the simplest terms of what were the interference concerns, what did the FCC do, and what really remains, if anything? So to the first question, what did, uh, did they mitigate the concerns? Absolutely. And in fact, the order goes into painstaking detail as to what Legato can and can't do. And in the event there is interference, the FCC even put safeguards within uh, their particular uh, usage. Uh, in terms of what the FCC did to mitigate the interference, not just by putting on restrictions on Legato, they in fact used several different tests to determine uh, what interference is, so, uh, whether or not there would be harmful interference. And that's an important distinction between what interference is and harmful interference. And the easiest way I can explain the distinction actually uh, is not me. I will take the analogy from uh, Senator Wicker, uh, who posited this analogy to uh, Commissioner O'Reilly, which was the idea that I'm having a conversation with you, but I may have air conditioning on in the background. Now the air conditioning is moving, it's making noise. However, you can still hear me. We can still communicate, although you still have that noise in the background. That is what interference is. That is not what harmful interference is. Now, if the air conditioner is blowing up and, uh, emitting such a sound that I can't hear you anymore, then that's a har that we call harmful interference. So I think that what, what the DOD is suggesting is we just want you to turn the air conditioner off. We don't care how much noise it's making. And that is, in effect, what the, uh, the, the proposition I see the DOD promulgating when it, uh, pro sorry, pro uh, proffering, when you have these types of conversations related to a 1 dB standard, and for the unfamiliar, a 1 dB standard is a hypersensitive standard, uh, which is if you turn the AC on, you're going to hear it and it's going to go off. Uh, and so it being whatever receiver or receptors are picking up that interference. So uh, what the DOD is asking for, from my perspective, is categorically unreasonable. And it's the FCC has essentially did everything it could to incorporate a lot of the comments that they received from the DOD, uh, the NTIA, uh, even the FAA, to ensure that every aspect of GPS was protected. And it seems as if they came not just to a measured approach, but a certainly a cautious and safe approach that, as you, everyone here has noted, uh, it was a unanimous decision and viewpoint to the point where even Jessica Rosenworcel did not uh, bat an eye. Uh, to voting yes on this because it was just such an obvious conclusion that the FCC had done everything that it uh, it was supposed to to moderate and mitigate inter interference. So I hope that answers the question. Well, could you talk a little bit about, or maybe Harold, either one of you talk about the guard bands? Because I think that's pretty important too, right? I mean, the, the, the bands between Legato, sir, you know, Legato, Legato and GPS or any other services are huge, aren't they? 
Um, yeah, and, and let me uh, uh, just, people I think are unaware of just how much the FCC mandated in order to make this safe. And, you know, they went well above what was required by law. But when this came up in 2010, 2011, Congress passed a law that said um, the FCC uh, would need to certify that there would not be, and I'm uh, quoting from uh, um, 47 USC uh, uh, 343 for those who want to uh, play along at home, says the commission resolves concern of widespread harmful interference to GPS. And the commission meticulously went over this and said, not only is there no widespread interference, but taking into account the worries that have been expressed by DOD and Department of Transportation through the FAA and others, here's what we're going to do. First, we're going to make Legato give up 23 megahertz of spectrum, which is a lot for uh, compared to the total license. And we're going to make that into what's called a guard band. So, you know, this is the uh, DOD says, oh, this is like somebody playing loud rock music next to your house. So the FCC said, okay, you know what? We're going to move the house two blocks away so it won't bother you. Then they forced Legato to reduce their power to less than that of a 100-watt light bulb. I mean, less than a, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, I think, something like 10 watt or 1 watt, I think, or something for the 10 watts for the base station, whichever it is, you know, it's less than what you get out of a you know, standard light bulb. So not only did they move the supposedly loud party two blocks away, they took away all their amplifiers and gave them acoustic guitars. So... The FCC has, and if that weren't enough, they mandated a special process by which Legato would be responsible for replacing and upgrading any equipment that the Department of Defense finds is experiencing interference uh, in order to ensure that national uh, defense prerogatives were protected. So it's kind of hard when you listen to um, people claim that, oh, you know, this is going to uh, tear down the roof uh, when, uh, you know, the FCC has just taken extraordinary measures here to protect uh, uh, GPS users generally and the Department of Defense specifically. So, yeah. Harold, since you raised the light bulb issue, I want to go to Daniel and ask him, you know, <laughs> if that's the case that, you know, based on these complaints, you know, GPS... <laughs> It sounds like GPS is so fragile it could be undone by a refrigerator bulb. Why haven't our enemies basically uh, been messing with GPS the past few decades? Yeah, I mean, it, that's an interesting question. For sure, our adversaries are collecting on our vulnerabilities. Uh, they collect lots of intelligence on our critical infrastructure, electric power grids and things like that, as well as GPS. Um, taking action is another thing. It's a good to have your capability to disrupt us on the shelf when you might need it. But it's over to us to protect our secure communications. And those are kind of two separate things. Uh, there's no question in my mind that we do a better job of protecting um, our, our mid-range band if we brought along not just DOD, but our super smart scientists to do it together. And, uh, and then collect the strategic and tactical intelligence we need to protect ourselves from adversaries like China, North Korea, Iran, and and Russia. Do you see any threat here? Here meaning? With regard to the Legato decision. I mean, do you see any threat to the national security? Again, the, the, the question was, you know, the way the opponents no. portray the decision, you know, it, it, it basically leads to the conclusion that GPS is so fragile it would could easily be, you know, hacked or undermined by yeah, I mean, I adversaries. Think Sure, I think our adversaries know just how fragile our GPS is, just as much as we do. Um, again, I think for this one, the problem for us is it's a big, giant, self-inflicted wound, and we're not managing it very effectively. That's to me, that's the greatest concern that I would have. And uh, and again, building up our our defensive capability so that we block others' efforts potentially in extremis to do us harm. That's a separate issue, and. Uh, and I think it's one that we can pursue, you know, concurrently here. I mean, DOD assumed, assumed control over, um, over the mid-band airwaves, you know, way back in the 1960s, they've just kind of had it since then, but they're not the only actor that matters here. They're not the only 
part of our national security team that matters. They're certainly worth listening to and, and hearing their concerns. Um, but if you listen to Attorney General Barr and Secretary of State Pompeo, they are strongly in favor of the legato proposal, and rightly so, in my view. So this is a good segue to talk a little bit about what's been going on in the Hill. And on May 6th, the Senate Armed Services Committee held what I think can only be described as a, a one-sided hearing criticizing the legato decision. And during the hearing, there was considerable focus, and I'd say confusion, about interference testing. So let's, we've talked a lot about interference. I don't want to belabor it too much, but let's try to clear the air a little bit more, maybe more about the process. So Joel, what was the testing process for the legato proceeding? Was this the responsibility of just one agency? Actually, in coordination with uh, more than a few, including the DOD, uh, you have the DOD that uh, suggested its own type of interference testing be, uh, be conducted, which given all the, that's why, you, that's why the order is shaped in the way that it's shaped in, mainly because of that test. But also the uh, FCC took in, or Rubato, I believe, worked with the FAA to work through some of the issues with aviation. And so you have a lot of uh, aspects of the order that address those aviation concerns based off of the recommendations that the FAA gave Legato and by extension, the FCC. Then you also had the DOT, and the uh, DOT which proffered the 1DB test essentially. And then the FCC looked at the 1DB test and said exactly what we already covered, which I won't go over again, which is, look, it's too sensitive of a test. It doesn't make, it's only for good policy to use that test. But yes, we addressed it, and, and uh, when we used it, we addressed why we're not uh, using that standard. So it was a multi-agency approach to come up with this, uh, to come up with, uh, with that determination that it did not cause interference. Okay, let me just take a pause because I realize there's both a chat and a Q&A, and it looks like most of the questions and answers are wisely going to the Q&A. So do not put your questions in the chat, put them in the Q&A, and we already have a bunch queued up. So I'm going to close the chat. And if you put your question in the chat, too bad. I'm not going to ask it. All right, let's, uh, let's continue talking a little bit about um, the Senate Armed Services Committee, uh, because they are in a tear here. So they included in the 2021 National Defense Authorization Act, a provision that prevents the Department of Defense from complying with the FCC's legato decision until the Secretary of Defense estimates the total cost of equipment replacement anticipated from, quote, harmful interference, and until the National Academy of Sciences does an independent review of the record. So Harold, what exactly, if anything, would this do? Doesn't it just hurt the Department of Defense? Yeah, I mean, this is um, in part because Armed Service doesn't have any jurisdiction over uh, uh, the FCC. So um, they are trying to reach this through um, the you know, jurisdiction that they have, and their solution is really um, just to, uh, uh, you know, uh, handicap the DOD. Um, all of these provisions that I just described about how the um, uh, FCC has set up all of these uh, precautions for the DOD and to protect DOD equipment and for DOD to report uh, um, if there is interference and you know, so Legato can uh, take care of it immediately. And what uh, the uh, NDAA now says is, well, you know, DOD, we're not going to let you use that until you go through all of these time-consuming processes. And, you know, number one, I'm not sure exactly what this is supposed to do, because if I'm legato, I will go to FCC and shrug and say, what do you want me to do? And the FCC would say, well, you know what? We did everything we could, and it's not our fault if Congress doesn't want DOD to take advantage of these protections. But the bigger problem is that this perpetuates the damage that is being done to the overall federal spectrum process and to the process of spectrum coordination. And I can't stress enough how this problem that has been developing and getting more and more complicated over the last three years, you know, is damaging to the future of 5G and the future of wireless because 
We are not going to see people want to invest, particularly not in any kind of new or interesting technologies. I mean, one of the reasons why we public knowledge supported Legato was because they offered a new and innovative idea uh, to introduce some competition in an unex you know, in a different direction than the usual cellular service. So we're like, fine, you know, that's good. We want to see more innovation. Um, and uh, uh, but now, you know, if you can, um, you know, if a federal agency can just go to its uh, committee and get uh, the FCC's um, reversed um, or, you know, just see this, you know, kind of stubbornness rewarded, um, then we're going to see people be a lot less interested in investing uh, in the space. Uh, and we're going to be a lot less likely to see new wireless uh, capacity made available for 5G uh, services or other advanced services. Good point. Joel, so normally congressional oversight is welcome, or at least it's a normal part of the process. What's the problem with the Senate Armed Service Committee exercising oversight here? I mean, is there a problem? There is, yeah. I think, and also Harold uh, hit on this a little bit in his response, which is, it's interesting to see that the, uh, the Senate Armed Service Committee is the uh, committee that's decided to do this, as opposed to a committee of jurisdiction, that, uh, or a typical uh, uh, committee of jurisdiction, like the, uh, the Senate Commerce Committee, or you, uh, I believe who, somebody else has uh, jurisdiction over transportation, but I believe that uh, usually this is out of Senate Commerce, and it's un- In the Senate uh, Commerce uh, and Transportation of the same committee. transportation, yeah. Yeah, and so I, to me, this is uh, wildly inappropriate in that you are making certain consider uh, that this the Senate Arms Service Committee is making determinations that are not part of their purview, and now they might be uh, affecting or infringing upon other statutes and other pieces of legislation uh, that have to do with this concept of interference and what does that mean? And it sounds like there's no coordination happening between what the Senate Arms uh, Service Committee is doing and what the actual committees of jurisdiction over the FCC is doing. And so I think that if anything, this is uh, uh, not, it's not inappropriate, it's just unhelpful and is almost uh, has a Kafka-esque complexity that is really, uh, that really adds to just the lack of uh, clarity to what the DOD wants out of this, what the Congress wants out of this, and ultimately what's good for innovation. I mean, okay. we can see from the, from the one-sided hearing, um, and now from, uh, you know, this uh, effort to try to write legislation that uh, this is not a committee that has familiarity with the FCC. It's not a committee that cares about the long-term consequences to spectrum policy. Um, it's, you know, it's really not, uh, there's a reason why they're not the guys who make the decisions on this stuff. Well, they don't agree with you because this week <laughs> uh, we expect uh, Senate Armed Services Committee Chairman, uh, Senator James Inhofe from Oklahoma to introduce the Retain GPS Act. It just came across our computers, what, two hours ago? Uh, the Retain GPS and Satellite Communications Act, which not surprisingly adds a whole bunch of conditions uh, before the FCC's legato can, uh, decision could take effect. So let's start uh, uh, maybe with you, Daniel, if you've got an opinion. Uh, are, these, is this, are these valid, these conditions? What are these conditions and are they valid? And, and what are the prospects for passage? I mean, I don't see them being valid, first of all. And much as, as Joel and Harold have emphasized, I don't see our elected representatives work in the problem more it's about their own parochial interests, unfortunately. Look, I, I'm gonna use a different example here. I was working at CIA when we launched the raid to target Osama bin Laden. There were plenty of people sitting around the table. Some people thought we should go and some people thought we shouldn't. There was a lot of discussion about that and a lot of people had different viewpoints and everybody's views were taken into account. And then there was a decision that was made and everybody got behind that decision, which was in our national interest. And what I'm seeing here is an absolute failure to do that. The process is so gummed up, unfortunately. And what we really need, at least in my view, is, is some kind of uh, leadership from the White House. I'd like to see our national security advisor step in, maybe do some old, um, you know, 
kind of suasion down at uh, down on Capitol Hill with our elected representatives there, the way President Johnson used to, and uh, get everybody on the same team uh, because otherwise we lose, and we're going to lose. I think as we pointed out, both commercially but also in our national security. China's moving ahead with deploying their own um, mid-range band, and if we don't step up now. Um, then we are going to lose out, and it'll be our future generations who pay the price. But I, I'm just going to I'm just going to hold off on hearing your guys' answers because one of the questions in the Q and A, and yeah, Walt, put your question in the Q and A, not in the chat, um, is that you know is the fact that the DOD and AG weighed in any indication of a message from the White House, <laughs> but they disagree, right? Yeah, I mean, I really think that. Um, um, you know, this is one where, uh, I mean, look, I don't, I think that the way Trump has run his administration as getting everybody to, uh, to fight and feud with each other has not been productive and has been one of the things that has contributed to the overall problem since getting all the federal agencies to go along with the process takes a lot of work. But in this case, it's very clear that uh, the folks who have the priority here, um, you know, the, um, uh, are saying, look, you know, this is a good decision. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, the folks who are saying otherwise are the ones who are basically defending their uh, uh, turf. I mean, there's no reason for uh, DOJ or uh, state uh, to want to weigh in on this, except as part of the, you know, kind of general effort that all of these agencies have been making uh, along the lines that uh, Daniel's been talking about of trying to get us to win the 5G race and, uh, um, you know, uh, our uh, face off with China. Well, let, let's get back to the to the bill, the retained GPS bill, because somebody's also in the Q&A has asked a question about it. Joel, you want to weigh in on, can you talk a little bit about what some of the conditions uh, 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 Senator Inhofe wants to put on uh, on this, uh, on the Legato decision and whether uh, are any of them valid? Or is this just a way to kind of play stall ball? I think it's just a way to play stall ball. I don't really see this moving forward. Uh, and uh, honestly, I, I would be very interested to see what anyone in Senate Commerce thinks about this bill and whether or not it, I, 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 it's just the way it's set up, uh, you know, and I mean, I'll just go on a limb and say that it's sloppy. Uh, and it doesn't make very much sense given what the FCC has already done. So this is just wholly unnecessary from my perspective. Okay, hey, let's turn to the interagency process because that's been the, you know, that's been the elephant uh, in this room for the last 40 minutes. So let's, let's dive into that a little bit. You know, the FCC is the expert agency in the U.S. government when it comes to allocating spectrum and in particular spectrum controlled by federal agencies. There's an interagency process with certain rules and procedures followed to ensure that all parties are heard. So spectrum that's controlled by the actual individual agencies themselves are subject to this interagency process that's normally led by uh, NTIA at the Department of Commerce. So let's talk a little bit about the history and Joel, I'm gonna to turn to you. Uh, throughout the past several years, we've seen numerous cases where interagency intransigence has slowed down the spectrum allocation process. Could you walk us through a few of these and, and, and talk about some of these examples of interagency breakdown and how it's affected the deployment of 5G and uh, the next generation of Wi-Fi? Absolutely. So, I mean, it, it's, it's happened both on the licensed and unlicensed front. Uh, we first saw uh, this sort of upheaval in the 5.9 conversation where the Department of Transportation, uh, well, more specifically NHTSA, which is a subset of the uh, Department of Transportation, uh, are, argued that the FCC, by removing some of its uh, protections granted to NHTSA and the DOT, would, you know, have more of a, uh, oh God, what a chicken little sort of effect. Like uh, car, uh, safety in cars are going to fall apart and the FCC is not following its procedures, even though there, there's plenty of evidence that suggests that there was multiple conversations that happened and that there were several conversations that uh, involved the NTIA and DOT and NHTSA uh, to the point where uh, they, it seemed as if NTIA was on board with a lot of what the FC uh, was doing and continues to be on board to a certain respect on 5.9. But something that was a little bit more egregious uh, was uh, happened uh, late last year 
uh, with NOAA, which is the uh, it's the NOAA's weather service. So, uh, and I'm going to butcher the what the actual spelling of NOAA is, but I think it's the National Oceanic and As Atmospheric Administration that. Uh, where they, where NOAA specifically petitioned the FCC to, uh, two days before, I think, it's 24 gigahertz uh, spectrum auction, said, whoa, 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 what are you doing, FCC? Put the brakes on, uh, we've not signed off on this. But if you went back and saw the record, they've had, uh, there's plenty of conversation about uh, using 24 gigahertz spectrum, which is just, uh, more high level spectrum for uh, more milliwave use. I think the, the typical use for 24 gig is going to be for what's called uh, wireless backhaul. Uh, so that's very helpful for, F for 5G because it helps connect spectrum bands and makes it makes spectrum flow a little bit more efficiently. So we need that band. Uh, FCC operated under the assumption that we had all the clearance and TIA basically gave all the clearance. Two days before NOAA throws this uh, fireball at the FCC and the uh, uh, something similar that happened in this proceeding with Legato, where the FCC gets called up to Congress, gets uh, rallied around and pushed by, pushed around by certain uh, congressional members on what they did or what they shouldn't have done. And ultimately, the FCC was able to say, we followed every procedure, we talked to NTIA, we, talk, we talked to NOAA, NOAA didn't express any uh, of these concerns to us or interference concerns. So we move ahead with it, and thankfully the 24 gigahertz uh, spectrum move move forward. We're able. Uh, I think that there's uh, deployments happening soon, if not happening now. And now you move over to the DoD, and, and what's happening in Legato, and it just seems as if there's all this this continued pushback and continued argument uh, argumentation that the FCC is not following these procedures when the FCC is doing everything not just conceptually, but feasibly, to incorporate all of these different government agencies to ensure that not only are they protected, but we are advancing and uh, expeditiously deploying 5G networks. So the FCC is walking and chewing gum, but they seem, uh, there are some agencies that seem more uh, willing to try to trip the FCC up as, we can, as it continues to move through its agenda that's been very public, very transparent, and it's just unfortunate that a lot of these government agencies are seeming to take this path as opposed to working with the FCC. Because as Daniel noted, we certainly need this to be internationally competitive. Carl, can you just speak a little bit toward, because I know you've been involved in some of these interagency groups. How does, how does the agency, how does this interagency process actually work? Like the yeah, nuts and, and bolts. And I was on the, uh, um, the uh, Commerce Spectrum Advisory uh, um, Spectrum Management Advisory Committee with yes. the CSMAC. Um, and really, this is a process that's been uh, developed over 20 years because, of course, this is very difficult and contentious for agencies. Agencies have legitimate uses. They're, you know, trying to do their jobs. Um, the whole point is that you have other um, you know, agencies like the FCC and also, frankly, the Office of the President that is trying to see the big picture in all of this. So the process works. There's something called the IRAC, um, which is uh, a essentially an advisory committee hosted within the NTIA, um, where the federal agencies that have spectrum allocations meet to uh, discuss the federal spectrum policy. Um, the NTIA is the officially delegated spokesperson of the executive and is supposed to be where policy gets formulated. Now, agencies have always bristled at that. Sometimes they're a little better about it than others. Um, but on the whole, for very important reasons, you are the executive branch is supposed to speak with one voice on spectrum policy. What we saw as a result of uh, the, the conflicts that, no, that uh, Joel mentioned um, was that when we had to go to the, uh, in, the International Telecommunications Union, the ITU, for the held every three years World Radio Conference, which sets up international coordination, we were really a mess. You know, with the agencies were constantly undermining uh, each other and the official position uh, of the administration. Um, and uh, it was really uh, phenomenal work uh, by uh, 
uh, our ambassador uh, um, uh, for the ITU uh, to the uh, World Radio Conference um, that held everything together and got things through. Um, and even after that, NOAA continues to litigate this in the press. Uh, but, you know, there is a standing FCC engineering team um, that um, handles the engineering analysis. It is one of the most respected um, in the world. Um, it is zealously insulated from political interference um, at the FCC. At this point, everything at the FCC has been politicized except the Office of Engineering and Technology because everybody understands that this is life or death stuff. And there is supposed to be a process through the NTIA where at government laboratories that are uh, handled by National Institute for Standards um, and Technology, you do this testing. And even if the other agencies don't agree with the FCC's conclusion, the fact is that there are always going to be differences of opinion. And this is why the FCC is the one that's in charge. And what's happened here is um, the agencies have increasingly decided, no, they're not going to play by this game. They're going to try to, you know, litigate this in the press or uh, uh, go back to uh, Congress to have them interfere. Uh, I will just conclude by noting that um, at the end of last year, you had a letter from the uh, um, Doyle, the chair of the House Commerce Committee, and Walden, the ranking member, joint letter to the Government Accountability Office to ask them to do an investigation on what has so messed up federal spectrum policy. Why are the agencies behaving this way? So this is a matter of you know considerable concern and the process that has been put together over two decades and has worked very well to secure U.S. leadership and wireless for over two decades is being torn apart by these agencies. Yeah, so based, you know, so Legato is just another example. So Daniel, let me turn to you and, and Harold, I think I'm right and you guys can correct me. I believe the letter was from uh, Mr. Pallone. The, Pallone, you're right, it was Pallone. Doyle is the, the subcommittee. The Pallone chairman the of the, chair. yeah, Pallone, um, uh, who is the who is the chair of the House Energy and Commerce Committee? But a rare bipartisan letter uh, is something to take note of. So, Daniel, uh, question for you: As someone with national security experience and analyzing our nation's telecommunications infrastructure compared to other nations, can you explain how unexpected bureaucratic delays can put our nation at a competitive disadvantage? Well, I think that's been you know a lot of what we've talked about today. Um, what makes us so strong in our country, you know, is, uh, is our different branches of government and our vibrant democracy and freedom of the press and all those things. And sometimes it impedes our ability to come together, especially in a bipartisan fashion, to solve our problems. Um, and that's, I think, been, if there's one, ta one of the takeaways, at least from this discussion today, is the need to do that. Um, we don't do that as much as we should, certainly on other issues as well. Um, but I think that's been, you know, the challenge for us. Look, I'll take our system over China's any day. But right now, Huawei and ZTE own about 40% of the telecommunications equipment. And in another few years, they'll own 70% of it. So that's what they're doing. And if we don't respond effectively and use all that's best about our democracy and win this one, then we're going to face the consequences and they're pretty dire. So I want to get to the questions and some of them we've already answered. Um, and some of them are so long that I'm just not going to read them. Uh, but I want to ask one final question. And if you can answer in a sentence or less, that would be great because I do want to get to the, um, to the questions. So beyond obvious trouble for Legato, name one long-term problem that will harm consumers and further 5G deployment if somehow the FCC's approval of Legato stalls out or gets reversed. So I'm gonna start with Daniel, then go to Joel, and then go to Harold to finish. Yeah, I'll just make it easy based on what I just said. I think our consumers end up with far less effective 5G, which is gonna hurt us commercially. And then you've got all those national security concerns I laid out. Joel? I think harm to competition and you have with fewer competitors, you don't have a diverse array of innovative services. So consumers will direct, directly be the, the harm party there. Okay, Harold? Yeah, I'll add that this is a real uh, 
um, you know, really uh, hurts investment, uh, especially in innovative new products, because, you know, investors need certainty and they need to know that uh, if they follow the rules that they're going to be able to build the network. Great. Okay. Um, so let me, let me start off with questions. This one was sent uh, by somebody who represents the GPS industry. I thought it was a very good question. You know, all of our focus has been on the Department uh, of Defense, and it's in the title and everything we've been talking about, but didn't DOT also have concerns, Department of Transportation, uh, including, you know, the impact on private sector GPS users, including police, fire, and other emergency vehicles, as well as commercial trucks and buses, general aviation, and maritime. So can you talk about how the Legato decision addresses those issues. Why, why didn't we talk about those issues? Sure, I, I, I could answer that. Um, sure. Uh, well, to, it's not just the DOD, again, going back to what the order actually does. The order doesn't just mandate that the uh, that Legato speak to the DOD, whatever the DOD has a problem. It, in fact, enforces a lot of provision, it has a lot of provisions that enforces the, uh, Legato to coordinate with to the GPS industry in aviation, in uh, a lot of these other uh, services that the uh, questionnaire <laughs> had, had proposed. So the, uh, the order does, uh, so A, on his first point, I assume he, uh, the FCC went out of its way to address some of the concerns that DOT had and actually went, paint, uh, went through uh, and used its test, described why its test didn't make good policy, uh, and, gave a very, and gave, put a lot of restrictions on uh, Legato to make sure that other GPS services wouldn't be affected. And in the event that they are, in the unlikely event that Legato's low power service would actually uh, affect uh, GP, uh, GPS in any of the ways that that, that uh, question describes, well, the uh, Legato has to coordinate with all of those folks and also has a, uh, a kill switch on that, uh, on, on their uh, particular service. So in, that could be triggered within 15 minutes of notification. So there's just an abundance of protections afforded to all of those services mentioned. Did, yeah, did you, I, wanna, I, you wanna follow up on that, Harold? Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanna say, if you look at the record, You'll find that over the years that the Legato folks were systemically addressing all of these and had agreements with a number of the uh, uh, GPS providers, a number of the uh, conditions that they put into the license and modifications of the license were the direct result of recommendations from DOT, from affected users. And it wasn't until this was about to be approved when DOD put their foot down that suddenly everybody started to trot out their old complaints again and ramp them up. I mean, this is really coming out of DOD. And frankly, the reason why is that DOD has the most spectrum of any federal agency. And they are concerned that if the FCC actually is doing its job and resolving these issues, that they may be at a disadvantage in future fights, that their ability to bully the other agencies um, and to stall things and bully things at the FCC is going to be reduced. I obviously do not think that is such a bad thing, having dealt with them in a bunch of these uh, procedures before. Uh, and, you know, Frankly, um, the FCC did everything that it could and finally said, okay, we're not going to let you just hold this up. We're going to actually make a decision. And, you know, this is, again, they've got an eight, you know, just to go to Joel's point, there's an 800 number that they, uh, that Legato has to maintain for GPS complaints. So, uh, and finally, there's one other point that I need to make that a number of these uh, commercial GPS units that they're worried about are actually very poorly designed. They actually listen in bands beyond the GPS band because that's a cheaper way to make them. And yeah, when you make consumer devices, you have incentive to uh, uh, make your device as cheap as possible. But if you make a uh, device that only works because the people who have the right to use the spectrum aren't using it, then, you know, I'm sorry, but when they actually get to turn their systems on, you need to expect that that's going to happen someday. So, okay, so Joel, uh, Joel, you uh, talked about a kill switch, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, somebody in the in the in the Q and A asked about that. How do bad do things have to get 
in order for the kill switch to be activated? Well, it's incredibly hypersensitive. <laughs> so I think it's, it's really, I think the test is, from my perspective isn't clear, but it's in the event that you experience, that you as a GPS operator experience any form of interference, uh, you call the number as, uh, as Harold said, and first they have, uh, they, have to, they have to shut it down. And then they conduct an investigation. Once they determine that there's no interference or the interference concerns have been ameliorated, they move on. But uh, to Harold's point, just really quick, I, I know you don't like it when uh, people ramble on you. I swear this is not what this is. But <laughs> on that point of aviation, uh, I was trying to look at this quote because I remember uh, it triggered my memory that Joel Zeb, uh, uh, Zabot, I believe his name is, he is the, uh, as, uh, he's the Associate Secretary of Aviation at DOT, said, and I quote, that uh, cellular services and certified commercial aviation services by our testing, by DOT's testing, would not receive hot one interference. So that is from DOT. If they're really that concerned about it, uh, I would refer them to, uh, uh, to the secretary, uh, to the assistant secretary's uh, statements on that. And didn't the CIO of the Department of Defense also say that everything was fine too? It's funny, funny. The staff has has some truth tellers in it. Let's put it that way. Yeah, how, how fun is that? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna end with uh, last question to Walt Pycheck, who, if you don't know him, you should because he's really smart and he's a uh, investment analyst in the space and he really knows the stuff. So his question is, as you mentioned, investors and even companies like certainty before putting the dollars behind making this available for public use. When is this noise over <laughs> and the risk of another suit or government challenge behind us or government change behind us? Both, change or challenge. So when can, when can Walt be comfortable telling his customers to invest? Well, you know, I, I think frankly, once this Congress is over, um, you know, uh, will there be a judicial, will there be a litigation? Sure. Um, but uh, the fact is that uh, um, this is the sort of thing where courts give incredible deference to the FCC. Um, and most spectrum cases like this are pretty much losers. Um, I think that uh, um, the FCC, I've been hearing, is likely to resolve the pending petitions for recon to, you know, just sort of get this out of the way. Uh, and certainly, uh, I think uh, uh, whoever wins the election uh, um, in November, if it's somebody who, uh, um, you know, cares about um, the FCC as an institution and our uh, ability to uh, have a coherent spectrum policy, um, I expect them to... Uh, uh, you know, to stand firm on this. So I think it's really just a question of sitting out this Congress um, until uh, uh, Inhoff gets tired of dropping bills and uh, we move on. So somebody just asked me about the Retained GPS and Satellite Communication Act. Um, it hasn't been introduced yet, so you're not going to find it on Thomas. Maybe uh, the Lincoln Project folks or the public knowledge folks could send it around to the registrants so they'll have it because it's it's widely available, but it is has not yet been introduced. It's expected to be introduced this week. So we are about at time. Uh, so this was fantastic, you guys. You did a, a, a wonderful job. These were great questions. Uh, I hope people learned a lot. And you know, if you if you want to talk more, I know that Daniel, Joel, and Harold are are available to answer your questions. Uh, we'll talk about it all day long. And uh, so I want to thank everybody for attending. I want to thank the three of you guys for coming on and sharing your knowledge with us and thank the Le Lincoln Initiative and Public Knowledge for sponsoring this terrific event. And thank you for moderating. Yeah, absolutely. That was Thanks, great. Thanks, Thanks, guys. Yeah.